It's always heartwarming to know that you're part of the plan of God. It's always heartwarming to know that God is not so much on your side, but you're on His side. So, praise the Lord. It's with that in mind, of course, that we have to view the crucifixion as well. Because with the human eye, when you look at the crucifixion, of course, it looks like just a load of defeat and destruction. But as we know, as we understand it from God's point of view, it's a salvation for mankind. Amen. So we've got to John 19 now, and uh, we're going to read from verse 1. We're reaching the summit of the gospel. Most people think that the crucifixion is the summit of the gospel, but really the summit of the gospel is the resurrection, which comes in the next chapter. That's the real, you know, real point that John is really building up to, that everything's building up to. But dramatically speaking, just to look at it, then the crucifixion, of course, is the most spectacular. Have you all got John 19? All right, then. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. But the Jews insisted, we have a law, and according to that law he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? he asked Jesus. And Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize that I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was about the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And here they crucified him. And with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. And Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. And the chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be King of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written... I have written. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. (coughs) Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Lord. Joe, lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can gather here, my Father God, tonight. Lord, my Father God, we thank you, Lord, that we can hear tonight from your living word. We would ask and pray, my Father God, for a brother Jerry, Lord. My Father God, that you give him the night that comes close to you, Lord. Lord, that you would speak to him, Lord. Keep our spirit and into our hearts and minds, Lord. Lord, we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Okay, as I've already pointed out, these two chapters really are the summit of the gospel that everything else has been building up to. Uh, This is the hour in which Jesus is glorified. And the fact of the matter is that John is more than just telling the story. John is doing a couple of other things. One is he shows Jesus very clearly fulfilling scripture, in particular the Psalms. And the other thing is, uh, he shows Jesus in priestly terms, in ritual terms. He uses a lot of words from the rituals and the, the laws of Moses concerning the tabernacle and later the temple. All right. Now, 
as we said, he's fulfilling the scriptures. And we pointed out last week that in the other Gospels, they use the Psalms for, say, a quarter of their Old Testament quotations. John, however, uses it for three quarters of his quotations. And within a few verses of the crucifixion, you've got four or five references to the Psalms. All right. So I've separated them out and I've put them at the top of the notes there. And you can see that between verses 24 and 36, you've got Psalm 22 mentioned, Psalm 42, which may also be Psalm 63 or Psalm 69. You've also got Psalm 69 in verse 29 and also Psalm 51, with some references there to Exodus and the Passover. And also in verse 36, you've got Psalm 34. All of those are psalms that were written by David, okay, and they all concern suffering. And it was more than just to show that Jesus suffered like somebody in Scripture. It was to show that Jesus was a person about whom David was prophesying. Because, for example, in Psalm 22, although John doesn't use this particular verse, in Psalm 22, verse 15 or 16, he says, they've pierced my hands and my feet. Now, as far as we know, that never happened to David. So it was understood that when David wrote those psalms, he was actually prophesying. But the question is, who was he prophesying about? John makes it very clear that he was prophesying about Jesus, the Messiah. He was prophesying into what would happen to Jesus. So David wasn't singing about himself and his own suffering. He was speaking about Jesus. Do you understand? John doesn't use that particular verse from Psalm 22, but he does use other references, all right, from Psalm 22. And the fact that we see four or five of them within a few verses shows how John is really hammering this message home. This is important to John as he's writing this gospel. This is a big point that he really wants us to get. You know, so often we just use texts from the Bible, verses from Scripture, as proof texts, you know, just to prove our point. But this is much deeper. This is about fulfillment. This is about fulfilling what God had prophesied about. You know, the fact that Jesus is suffering shows that he is indeed the man sent by God. Okay, whereas, as we pointed out a few weeks ago, the Jews would say, oh, well, he suffered, therefore he's not from God, because they had a simplistic idea that they'd made up of their own, that if you were in God's will, then everything would go rosy. If you were naughty, then God would punish you. So therefore, when they see Jesus being punished, then they say, well, therefore he was a sinner. He can't have been from God. But John is keen to show that, in fact, the very reason that they object to Jesus is actually the very reason to accept Jesus because he fulfills scripture, and nobody else can do that, all right? Uh, the other thing that John does is he ties Jesus very much with, he describes him with priestly, temple, tabernacle, ritual terms, right? Uh, we see there at the top, the, the, the quote from Psalm 22 is about the fact that his robe is not torn, and it was pointed out that in Exodus and in the law of Moses, then the priest was to wear a robe that was never to be torn, Okay? And so therefore, you know, he's, he's hinting at these things and he's showing, look, Jesus is the high priest. It's quite obvious that Jesus is also the sacrifice and we've read through the gospel that Jesus is the temple as well. All right. So you can see that John is really piling on all the evidence, all the, all the, the points that he wants to make. And he's put them all into one very intense passage, very intense indeed. So there's a lot to get through. So I put most of it in the notes because obviously I'm not going to actually be able to get through all of that as part of the teaching, because I'm limited as to time, all right? So let's go through the, the actual uh, passage, starting with verses 1 and 2. This is after the Jewish nation have made their decision. They've made their decision that they want to get rid of Jesus, and they've handed him over to Pilate. Pilate has cross-examined him, and yet the irony is that they want to get Jesus crucified uh, supposedly because he's broken the law, but we've seen all the way through that he's never broken the law. What's odd is that these are supposed to be the people of God. These people represent the Lord. These people represent Moses and his law. They're supposed to be righteous. They're supposed to stand for honesty and everything. Here they are up against Pilate, who's a Gentile, probably an idol worshipper and all that goes with it, and yet he's seen as more righteous because he doesn't want to condemn an innocent man. He won't do it. He refuses to do it, okay? Eventually he gives in under pressure, intense pressure, but he's seen as clearly being more righteous than the Jewish people, okay? But the fact that Pilate again and again in this passage says, look, this man's innocent, I'm not going to charge him, 
further underlines the determination and the guilt of the Jewish leadership. Okay? Not all Jews. We shouldn't just say the Jews in a, a blanket way because, of course, remember that the disciples were Jews, that the early church was all Jews who were believers. But very specifically, we're talking about those in authority over the Jewish nation. So they represent the Jewish nation as such. Okay? And this is the point at which the Jewish nation really pulls away from the plan of God and decides to go it alone without God. Because they reject God who's standing in their midst. Okay? And as Pilate pushes the fact that he's innocent, their guilt is just underlined all the more because they're given pause for thought. They're given reason to repent. They're given reason to think, no, actually he is innocent. We shouldn't be doing this. You know, they can't just say that they were rushed along in the heat of the moment because it was all dragged out. It's as if God is being merciful to them. God is controlling everything, remember, even what Pilate says and does. Okay? And so God is still giving them opportunity to repent. He's still appealing to those people, look, repent. So that when judgment comes, there can be no mistakes made that they can't say, well, we didn't realize. Because he'll point out, well, it was pointed out to you again and again. It was underlined again and again. You had opportunity after opportunity to repent and to change your ways. But yet they refuse it. And as they declare him worthy of death, then we start to see something very... I don't know what the word is, macabre, it's, it's a kind of humour, there's this black humour about this, because they decide to crown him as king. Of course, straight away we'll see the irony of that, because of course he really is the king. He's not just the king of the Jews, he's the king of the universe. He's the king of the whole world. He's the king of everything. And here he is, standing in their midst, and yet these soldiers, probably Roman soldiers, along with the Jews, put a crown on his head, put a purple robe on him that's a regal colour, a royal colour, a purple robe, and they start to mock him. They kneel down before him and mock him and hail him king of the Jews. The irony, of course, is not lost on you because the thing is, he really is the king. And little do they realise that what they're doing is that they're judging with what they see. They're judging by the surface appearance of things instead of what is true, instead of making a right judgement. And... What's interesting as you come down to verse 4 is very interesting. Verses 4 and 5, Pilate brings him out dressed this way. And he's there in public before the whole crowd. And it says, here is the man. Now, I'm just going to jump ahead a little bit down to a few verses below. Where, of course, later on in the day, he's called out as, here is the king. And if I can just put this to you, that maybe this is a way of Jesus speaking to the, the Jewish people, speaking to the world, speaking to anybody who's reading John's Gospel, that this is, as it were, a theatrical acting out of the life of Christ. Because he came the first time as a man, but what will he be when he comes again? The king. He came as a king the first time, of course, but his identity was hidden because he didn't declare openly who he was by his appearance they judge with their eyes and they just see a man yes he came as just a man he was a human being like anybody else he was a natural flesh and blood human being but when he returns what will he be this same crowd will see him on that day and they'll recognize him they will look upon the one that they have pierced and they will mourn they will mourn as somebody mourns for their only child because they will say I know that face I know that man I know what I did to him I know how I rejected him. He was the king all along, and I didn't know. You see, the first time Jesus came as a man, came in peace riding on a donkey, but in Revelation 19, of course, he returns on a horse to bring war and judgment. And it says that the people of the earth, both great and small, will hide from him. They'll call to the mountains, fall on us. Hide us from the wrath of the Lamb, because this Lamb of God is going to come back terrifying and judgmental. And the fact of the matter is that, in a sense, we see here, in this passage, the life of Christ being acted out from beginning to end. Here is the man, and then later on, here is the king. In Zechariah 6, you'll see a reference there. Then there's the crowning of a king, and he's described as the man. But it's about a, a man in the Old Testament, but it's, in a sense, there's a sort of prophetic hint towards the life of Christ, towards Jesus.
All right. And again in Zechariah, later on in Zechariah, in a passage which is quoted here at verse 37 of chapter 19 and in Revelation 1 7, then it speaks about the one that they will look upon, the one that they have pierced. And that's from Zechariah. And in Revelation it says that they will mourn. And indeed they will, as we've already said. The irony is, of course, I know there's a lot of irony in this. I'm going to say irony an awful lot tonight because this is what this whole passage is. The whole thing is almost like a bad joke. right? The whole thing is, is there's this black humor that runs all the way through it. As Jesus is brought out, he's dis- declared to be perfect. He's declared to be innocent. I'm bringing him out to say I have no charge against him. He's innocent. There's nothing wrong with him. Now, if you know Jerusalem, you'll know the big square Temple Mount. You'll have probably seen it on the news. The Antonia Fortress, where this was taking place, is on one end of it. It's attached to it. Okay? And just next to the Antonia Fortress is a little gate, which is called the Sheep Gate. And the Sheep Gate is the gate through which the sheep used to come. And as they came into that temple precinct, they were examined. They were looked at. They were, there were various tests that the, that the examiners used to, to, to go through, various tick lists, as it were. And when they got all the way through and they were a perfect lamb, that they were completely flawless, then they were declared worthy of death. Now that's the opposite of judgment, isn't it? When you sin, you're declared worthy of death, when you've got a problem. But these animals, when they were seen to be perfect without a problem, then they were declared worthy of death because these were animals for sacrifice. And here is Jesus outside that same fortress, right next to the sheep gate. And he's declared to be innocent. What is their response? He's worthy of death. You can see exactly where that's driving, can't you? He is a sacrificial lamb. When he's found to be perfect, he's found worthy for sacrifice. Do you understand? Worthy of death. Because he's innocent. For all of us, we're worthy of death because we've sinned. But he's worthy of death because he's innocent. Because only a perfect lamb could make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of all of us. It's fantastic, isn't it? You can see so much in this. All right? Pilate pushes for a charge from the Jews. He said, look, you've got to have a reason for killing this man. And in verses 7 to 9, then you finally find them coming up with a charge, which before they just said, well, he was a criminal, whatever. Right? And Pilate could see straight through it. But now they come up with a case. And what is their case? He's claimed to be the son of God. Now, first point, it's not against the law of God to claim to be the son of God. Okay? Second point is, even if it was, for Jesus it's true. So either way, he's innocent. Either way, he has not sinned. Their charge is unfounded. Their charge is unfounded because it's not in the law. Their charge is unfounded because he hasn't broken any laws. Their charge is unfounded because he truly is who he claims to be. And so therefore, in any which way, whatever you look at it, what the Jews are bringing against him is nothing. It's meaningless. Absolutely meaningless. So even now, they really can't come up with anything. But Pilate, however, is extremely scared when he hears this. He knows that he's got a hot potato on his hands. And he's got to get rid of it as soon as he can. Because either there's going to be a riot in the city, or he's going to lose his job. It was his job as a governor just to keep the peace. He wasn't there to sort out people's problems, just to keep the peace. Right? They could do what they wanted behind closed doors, but this was in public. Okay? And so therefore he's worried, probably, that he'll either become the next target for them, or that his boss, which is the Roman Emperor or Caesar, is going to come and take him out of his job. Possibly even kill him. That was the kind of thing that Caesar tended to do. Okay? And so one way or another, Pilate is getting really, really frustrated at this point. Okay? He's getting really aggravated. And he's intrigued at the same time. There is a hint as he comes back in and he says, like, where do you come from? To Jesus. There's a hint that he's beginning to understand or even believe in who Jesus is. He's beginning to understand that Jesus really is not from this world. Because any other man, any normal human being, would at this point have been pleading for his life, please let me go, please let me go. I mean, I haven't done anything. And yet, Jesus is just perfectly calm. When Pilate asks him questions, he just remains silent most of the time. And Pilate is just thinking, this is not a normal man. And yet, quite clearly, he's not a raving fool. He's not dribbling and and crawling up the floor. He's quite clearly a perfectly level-headed person and yet he's not scared for his life this doesn't make sense Pilate's never come across anything like this before in his life Pilate is a man who's well used to being able to call for execution probably well used to killing people himself he's an experienced soldier 
He'd have climbed to the top of his tree by killing a lot of people in battle at first. And the fact of the matter is that he's seen people at the point of death many times. But this is totally different. This is something that really he can't understand. And the passive way in which Jesus is accepting all of this is what really freaks Pilate out. If he was kicking and screaming, that wouldn't freak Pilate out as much because it would make sense to him. And Jesus just gently reminds him because he's a man that's used to power and authority. He can give an order and have people killed. He can give an order and send out an army and slaughter whole towns if he wants to. He's reminded that he has no power. That would have been a bit of a shock to Pilate's system. No power? Excuse me. I'm running this country. No, you're not, says Jesus. God's running everything. Not just this country, but the whole world. And we're reminded yet again about the sovereignty of God. We've seen this all the way through. John's Gospel, we saw it in chapter 18. The sovereignty of God at the arrest of Jesus. Jesus went because he wanted to. They didn't arrest him. He decided to go with them. Okay? And here we see that Jesus is very much in charge. God is very much sovereign. And that's what gives Jesus his peace to go through this because nothing's going to happen except what God wants to. And yet, even as we're reminded even then that Judas handed Jesus over, it was all part of God's plan because it was prophesied about him in the Old Testament. Yet at the same time, we're reminded that man is responsible because man has free will. It's extraordinary. There's this real paradox, because we, we've seen this paradox, this, this strange thing going on between the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. All these people, they're given this choice again and again and again to repent, and yet they refuse, so therefore they're subject to judgment. It's their choice. God hasn't made them do it. It's their choice. Even with Judas, he's still responsible for his own actions. The strangest thing of all with Judas is a couple of times it says that he's one of those who is chosen by God and given by the Father to Jesus. And it says that Jesus would never lose anybody who was given to him by the Father. And yet Judas is lost. Paradoxes. It's very strange. We see these two things running at the same time. Somehow or other they're both true. Yet somehow or other we can't marry them up in the logical mind. I can't get my head around that. But what I have to understand is that God's ways are more profound. God's ways are higher than my ways and I simply can't understand them. And if I could understand my own theology, it probably wouldn't be right. And that's the way it is. So we see this rather strange thing going on where Jesus just says, look, you're not really in charge. God's in charge. And yet at the same time, we see him admitting that there is sin, which is a contradiction of God's sovereignty, a paradox. As you come down to the verses 12 and 13, then the Jews actually start to make a deliberate choice, not just to reject Jesus, but to accept Caesar. Caesar was a Gentile. Now, remember before, they had these dreams of a military messiah, a man who would bring in the Jewish kingdom, a man like David, drive out the Gentiles and bring in the Jews. They chose Barabbas because he was a military man and he would lead them like Maccabees did, you know, drive out the Gentiles and bring in a Jewish kingdom. But now they're actually so bent on getting rid of Jesus that given the choice, they'd rather have a Gentile uh, idol worshipper like Caesar an immoral man. That's what they prefer. And they said, look, look, we prefer to have Caesar in the end. They hint at it here. They say, like, you know, they start to use Caesar against Pilate, saying, look, Pilate, if you, if you let this man go, then Caesar's going to get angry with you, bringing political pressure on him. And eventually they actually make a choice. We have no king but Caesar. It's incredible when you see the, how far these people will go, how far they will go. In verse 13, Pilate comes out to a place called the stone pavement okay and he says here at the end of verse 13 in Aramaic it's called Gabbatha but Gabbatha does not mean stone pavement in Aramaic it actually means back and it's understood that he's not translating the the Greek stone pavement name into Aramaic with Gabbatha what he's saying is that this is where it's at it's at the back of the temple so in other words he's placing it where it is this is on the other side of the Antonia Fortress, at the back of the temple itself, which is roughly where the Western Wall is now. And what's interesting is that there you, the, the Western Wall, as you see it, have you seen it where the, the Jews all pray? Yeah. 
and they put bits of paper in the wall. That's the western wall of the old Temple Mount, as it was at this time. Okay? And uh, as you go further along, then you actually come to ground level, because where the Jews are actually standing now is only halfway up the wall. The rest of it is buried with rubble from where Jerusalem has been destroyed 17 times. And that wall has been pulled down, and all the rubble has been left at the bottom. They brought in more stone to build it back up, but it's been pulled down again. And so therefore, the ground level has come right up. And you dig a tunnel down, there's a tunnel down that you can walk down, and you can go along the bottom of the western wall. So you're underneath where the people are praying. And down there, there is a stone pavement. It was a road that's made with stone flags of a quality that you would only normally see inside a building. They're not like rough flagstones that you would normally see on a street. Industrial grade flagstones. They're fine quality, polished stones. And it would have been quite a remarkable sight to see that out of doors. And that's possibly what it's talking about. Okay? And if so, then that's the actual place. And you can go there, you can see it, and you can touch it. And it's down in a tunnel underground at the bottom of that wall. Underneath where those people are praying. And if that's the actual place, then it's interesting that he actually calls it Gabbatha. Because that means it's at the back of the temple, which is where the western wall is. So he's actually placing it as an actual location. All right? But what is actually missed is this. As you read it in the English versions, then it sounds like Pilate brings Jesus out and sits on the throne, on the bermatos, the beamer seat. You assume it's Pilate who sits there, don't you? But it's not. It's Jesus. And that turns it around totally. Because Pilate brings Jesus out, crest with his purple robe and his crown of thorns, and he enthrones him, puts him upon the throne, his coronation is complete as he declares, here is your king. Here is your king. And you just think about the way that this is such a mockery of what the Jews are doing. Because they think they're taking the mickey out of Jesus. They think they're having fun with Jesus. They're just being spiteful. But one day, once again, there will be a vast crowd of all the people from all the nations including the Jews and they will look and they will behold a man upon a throne with a crown upon his head and they will see and they will recognize him and he will judge them when they shout take him away take him away the original language says lift him up lift him up and the irony of that is of course they'd have been talking about the crucifixion They'd have been saying, lift him up on a cross. But lifting him up is something else, isn't it? We use that in a different way, don't we? Because we lift Jesus up with our praise. Amen. One day, that whole crowd, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. We are those who have done it voluntarily because we believe, but they will do it against their own will. They will bow whether they like it or not. They will be pushed to the floor and they will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Not for salvation, but for their own damnation. That's an incredible thought, isn't it? Finally, Pilate gives in. Ironically, again, he does so for peace. He does so thinking that if I hand Jesus over, I'll have peace. This riot will be over. But the twist in the tale is twofold. One is that the crucifixion of Jesus did not bring peace to Jerusalem. It's because of the crucifixion of Jesus and the rejection of the Jewish people that Jerusalem was completely destroyed 40 years later. And it was the Romans who came and did it. The Romans pulled Jerusalem to the floor and burned it. The second thing is that, of course, the death of Jesus indeed does bring peace. It brings peace to all mankind, doesn't it? It's through the death of Jesus that we have peace with God. And that all men, including the Gentiles, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles, through faith, can have peace with God. Jesus goes out, as we come down to about verse 16 and 17. And it says here that he's carrying his own cross. And he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And here they crucified him. Now it says that he carries his own cross. In Luke's Gospel, of course, it tells us that Simon of Cyrene helped him some of the way, but John just misses that out. It's not important to him. And 
the idea that most of us have is that he's carrying the entire cross, the upright and the cross piece. But the chances are he's really just carrying the cross piece because the entire cross would have been too difficult for one man to carry. Because for a piece of wood to actually support the weight of a full-grown man, it's got to be thick. It can't be some th spindly little piece of two by two. So Jesus would not have been able to carry it. Okay, so the chances are he just had the cross piece. The other part of that is that several times in Scripture, and the references are here in the, in the notes, uh, it says that Jesus died on a tree. Now remember that execution was supposed to be as easy, as quick, and as cheap as possible. Right? They didn't bother getting pieces of timber from the timber yard and splicing them together and doing all sorts of carpentry on them. They just wanted it cheap and nasty. Okay? So basically a simple log would do for the cross piece. And what you would use for the upright is an existing tree. Just bang them to that. Okay? So living trees or trees which have been stripped of their branches were used quite often for crucifixion. And it made a lot more sense. Because when you see these films whereby they've got Jesus on a cross and then they've got the difficulty of how to get him up in the air and you've got ropes and pulleys and you've got teams of men pulling, why go to all that trouble? The ancient Catholic sort of medieval ideas of Jesus being right up in the sky are very improbable because why would they lift him up that high? The idea was just to kill him. Much more likely that actually he was at eye level. And we'll see later on how somebody uses a, a brush a short stick to his mouth to give him a drink he must have been within arm's reach couldn't be right up there where you needed a ladder to get up to him those are all catholic medieval ideas get those out of your head bring him down to eye level on a natural tree with a cross piece being spliced to it with a piece of rope and that's it okay very simple very basic very savage Apart from that, there's really no details to add to crucifixion because when somebody you love has suffered, you don't really want to go into the details. But simply put, by being hung by your arms, it puts tension on your ribcage so you can't breathe properly. And so therefore, because you can't cough and you can't clear your lungs, your lungs start to fill up with your own water. It's called dry drowning. But if you're just hung by your arms, you'll be dead in a few minutes. And so the Romans, to stretch it out and make it more painful, pinned the legs to the tree trunk so that then the man could push himself up so that then he could breathe. But he could only push himself up for a few seconds because, of course, his legs were in agony, being pinned. He wasn't pushing on something comfortable. So he dropped down again. And he pushed himself up and he dropped down again. Pushed himself up and dropped down again until eventually, out of dehydration and exhaustion, he would eventually give up and his lungs would fill up with water. That was crucifixion. It was agonizing. It was disgusting. And it's amazing how man puts more effort into killing his fellow man than he does into good things. Whoever thought out that way of killing somebody really had to sit down and think about it. Really had to, th you know, experiment with that. And it really just highlights just how sinful and depraved mankind really is. That they could even think of such things. We don't know really where Golgotha was, but there's one place which is famous because it looks like a skull when you look at the hill, but the chances are that 2,000 years ago it didn't, because rocks change, the landscape changes, the wind and the rain changes rocks, and so maybe it didn't look like a skull back then. But if it is the place, then it's interesting that next door to it there's a tomb which fits the description that, Jesus, uh, has, that John has in his gospel about the tomb that is only ever used once. Okay, it had never been used before, and Jesus is laid in it, because in that tomb, there are three places for bodies, but the other two places have never been finished, so therefore they couldn't have been used. But the one place has been finished. So it looks like the place was made for three bodies, but only one was ever buried in there. What is interesting is that at Golgotha, the chances are that actually he was crucified at the bottom of the hill, not at the top. Again, medieval paintings sort of put him up on the hill so he's up against the sunshine and all this kind of stuff and it looks more dramatic. But in reality, nothing was dramatic or theatrical about it. In reality, it was just savage murder. And they weren't interested in dragging him up a hill. They just crucified him at the bottom. And that would make a lot more sense because it says that where he was, people could read the sign that was over his head 
and people could pass by and see him and talk to him and all that. If he was up at the hill, they wouldn't have been able to see him because the old road travels at the bottom of that hill, 100 yards from that hill. It's also possible that Stephen was actually killed there as well. What is interesting about that sign that Pilate puts up is that it's written in three different languages. Now the word for things which are written is the same word as for scripture. And I think that John is playing with this because Pilate writes these things and he writes them in three different languages which means that they were trying to proclaim something to the Gentiles, not just to the Jews. It wasn't just in Aramaic, in the Hebrew language or anything like that. It was written for the, for the Gentiles who were passing as well so that everybody would know from every nation. But what's interesting is that when it's written, the Jews insist that it be changed. They say, come on, you've got to change it. And Pilate says, what I have written, I have written. Literally, what is scripture is scripture. You see, this is typical for the Jews. The Jews see something written in the Bible and they try to change it to fit what they believe or what they want. We're not supposed to do that, are we? We're supposed to see scripture and if we don't agree with it, we're supposed to change. If our theology doesn't match up with scripture, we're supposed to change our theology. If our manners, if our ways, if our lifestyle doesn't match up with the law of God, we're supposed to change our lifestyle. But what do the Jews do? They change the law. They add to the law. They take away from the law. They put their traditions over it. They put their own interpretation on it to change it so that they don't have to. But Pilate here, the Gentile, says, what is scripture? Is scripture. What I have written is written. That's it. And it's like a snub for them. Stop trying to change what's written and start to live by it. Start to live to it. Start to change yourself instead of changing the scriptures. They were experts at the law. They were expert lawyers. You see now lawyers can twist a case and, and twist the evidence. And we think, oh, he's a clever man. But so often you'll see a, a clever lawyer get an innocent man condemned or get a guilty man acquitted. Is that right? Is that what the law is really for? The law is there to protect the innocent. And yet here it's being used in quite the opposite. That is to say, their version of the law. The law itself, of course, is not being used like that. What is, un what is, is so funny about this is that unwittingly they have fulfilled Scripture. Unwittingly, Judas has fulfilled Scripture. Unwittingly, everything they're doing is, in fact, fulfilling Scripture. This is the bizarre thing about it. They're so het up with changing everything and doing their own thing. But all the time, all they can really do is what God wants them to do anyway. What God has prophesied about them. They can't do any other. And it's very, very strange because you see again that paradox between free will and the sovereignty of God coming through and intriguing us and puzzling us and making us think that we really don't understand God or God's ways. As we come down to verse 23, it says that the soldiers crucified Jesus and they decided to divide his garments. That was common enough practice. But what's interesting is that John brings in a psalm here from Psalm 22, verse 18. And if anything, it's a, it's a reference to Exodus 28, verse 31, whereby the priest was to have a robe that was never to be torn. And this is one of John's hints that Jesus is indeed the priest. All right. Psalm 22, as we've already said, is a psalm of David, and it's about the suffering servant as well. So in two, it, it, G, uh, John kills two birds with one stone. He not only shows Jesus to be a priest, right, that fulfills everything in the Old Testament, so therefore the Jewish people do not need a high priest anymore, but also he shows Jesus to be the suffering servant, the man who fulfills all of those prophecies. Hallelujah. As you come down to verses 25 and 27, all right, there's a very personal little note here. The tone of it changes completely because near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his aunt and several other people and it seems that the beloved disciple was there as well and indeed, if anything, that's John because we know from various history books or what have you that Mary stayed with John when John moved from Israel and he went up to Ephesus, which is in modern-day Turkey. Then Mary went with him 
and as far as we can make out that's where she died and that's where she was buried okay it's also interesting because we can realize now that Luke who lived in Turkey Luke the doctor was converted when Paul was on one of his missionary journeys he came from Troy which is where Istanbul is now and he got saved and he came and there's a lot in Luke's gospel about the childhood of Jesus and he must have got that from Mary so therefore Luke must have been in Ephesus as well at some point where Paul was and John was and there he got all the eyewitness accounts from Mary. So the first parts of the Gospel of Luke are in fact from Mary. That's an intriguing thought, isn't it? Okay. What's interesting, however, is a couple of things. One is, as I've already pointed out in other passages, where Jesus is at the height of his suffering, where Jesus is going through agony his concern is still for other people. And every time I read passages like that, I just can't get over it. Because if I'm having a hard time, I think everyone else should pander to me. They say, hang on a sec, I'm in the middle of this, I'm having a hard time here, you help me. But yet Jesus is more concerned for other people. And I don't think that's just because they were people who were close to him. I don't think that's just because it was Mary, his mother. I think that there's something much broader than that because Jesus shows that same concern for other people even for the Roman soldiers who are crucifying him. The other thing is, very striking, is that there's a big place given to women in the middle of the ministry of Jesus. You'd expect, you know, we normally think that uh, Jewish men are going to be, uh, uh, what's the word, chauvinistic. You know, that they're going to put women down. But we see here, and we see later in John's Gospel, in John 20, where Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene, where he takes time out for women. And it shows what a high place, what a high regard he had for women. It's quite remarkable. It's quite remarkable. We see several passages like that. He might only have chosen men as disciples, but women were very important and always will be. As the close starts, as we get to about verse 28... It says, later, knowing that now was all completed. All was now fulfilled. Okay. Jesus seems conscious, even at this point, of the fact that his father gave him a mission. His father set out a race for him to run. You'll find references like that elsewhere in the the New Testament, whereby it seems that God has a purpose and a plan, a tick list, as it were, of jobs for each and every one of us and this goes for Jesus this goes for all those who are saved he has a purpose for everything we have certain things that we must achieve and when we finish that list then finally we can die we can say right we've done everything elsewhere Jesus spoke about I must complete the work that God has sent me to do that the father has sent me to do and it's interesting that the emphasis for John and for Jesus and for anywhere else in the New Testament the emphasis is on completion of the task not starting it It's about completion. You must carry it to completion. You must endure to the end. And Jesus seems to be getting to that point whereby he knows that he has endured to the end. He knows that he has fulfilled and done everything that he's supposed to do. For Jesus, of course, those tasks, those things were laid out in Scripture. They were prophecies about him. And he had to fulfill those prophecies. For us, there's no prophecy in Scripture as such. You know, there's no book of Jerry whereby all the things that I must do are laid out. But I know that God has a plan for me. I know that he has a purpose for me. And I know that I've got to fulfill that. I've got to do that. When I've done all of that, then finally I can go. And I won't go until that's done. Paul speaks about the race that he has to run. Hebrews talks about a race that's marked out for us. Hebrews 12. And we need to be aware of that. That God has a purpose for all of us. He has a ministry for all of us. Not that you be in church leadership. Not that you're going to be a preacher. For men and women, God has a purpose for us. And he wants you to do something. He wants you to achieve something with your life in him. Not just make up a number in a church. He's got a plan for you. The question is, do you know what that plan is? You need to think about that. And you need to say, Lord, I want to fulfill that. I want to do that. What's also interesting is that here we see a word repeated whereby it's not necessarily completed but paid for. In fact, later on in verse 30, the final words of Jesus, it is finished, can be translated as it is complete, 
In other words, I've done all the work that the Father sent me to do. It is fulfilled, talking of scripture, or it is paid. What could he be talking about if he's talking about something being paid? He died for our sin. The price that was set for our sins was death. The wages of sin is death. This is the atonement. So therefore, at this point, Jesus can say, it's been paid. But what's interesting is, of course, at that point when he says that, he's still alive. So if he says it has been paid, what was he talking about? He's not talking about his physical death when he breathed his last. He's talking about something else. What is he talking about? Separation from God. In Genesis 2, Adam is told, when you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. You will, a death of deaths, you will die, literally in the Hebrew. Right? And when Adam ate that fruit, did anything happen to him? Did his heart stop? Did he fall over? No. So what was the death that God was talking about? Separation because of sin. So it is in Ephesians 2 verse 1, it says that we were dead in our transgressions and sins. We were dead because we were separated. But when we become believers, what happens? We become alive. And hasn't that been something that we've seen in John's Gospel? Those who believe have crossed over from death to life. You started your eternal life when you were born again. We've had that time and time again in the early parts of the Gospel, where we see that. The death that Jesus died was that when he was on the cross, it was dark for three hours, even though John doesn't mention this. John doesn't mention the three hours of darkness. He doesn't mention the cry of dereliction from Psalm 22. Eloi, Eloi, lama sapachthani. Get the tongue around that one. Right? The fact of the matter is that at that point, Jesus was separated from his Father for three hours. He experienced what we experience when we're sinners. When we were unsaved, we were separated from God. That was the death that paid for our sins. That's amazing, isn't it? After that, after he's paid for our sins, then he gives up his spirit. Then he dies. So it's not the physical death of Jesus that pays our sins alone. You notice I didn't say alone, right? It's the separation from God. That death. That death. Which is often missed out. The whole thing goes together as a package because, of course, we know that mortal life, mortal death, natural death, physical death is the result of sin. It came into the world just as disease came into the world. Death came in through sin. And it's not just talking about separation from God there. It's talking about mortality. So we know that the whole thing goes as a package. But we have to have that complete package when we talk about Jesus' death paying for our sins. It was his separation from the Father and the Spirit and his physical death. Amen? Are you all with me? Good. Final point here with the crucifixion. It says that he says it is finished and with that he bows his head and gives up his spirit. I'm going to say something that sounds a bit heretical. Crucifixion didn't kill Jesus. What am I talking about? He gave up his own life. Jesus was not dead. Crucifixion, if you remember I said, your lungs fill up with your own liquid. When your lungs are full, you can't breathe. If you can't breathe, you can't speak because you need breath now to speak. Right? If Jesus could speak, that means that his lungs were clear. Crucifixion didn't kill Jesus. He'd finished his work. He'd completed everything. He'd fulfilled all the scriptures. He'd paid for our sins. Job done. Father, I'm coming home. Father, I'm gone. And he bows his head and he gives up his spirit. Marvellous. What control over his own life. The sovereignty of God is sealed with this final little act. Jesus decides when to die. He doesn't die when man wants him to die. He doesn't die when his body says so he dies when he's done he dies when he's finished his job fantastic the sovereignty of God is complete it says in verse 31 that it was a day of preparation and the next day was to be a special Sabbath very important point here for time scales most of us believe in Good Friday don't we okay that's a Catholic tradition If Jesus was crucified on the Friday, that would mean that he was only in the tomb for 36 hours. By no stretch of the imagination can you make 36 hours equal to three days. 
Because 36 hours is half three days, isn't it? It was a special Sabbath. That means that there was at least two Sabbaths. I would argue a case for even three Sabbath days. Three Sabbath days, maybe. But at least two. It was a bank holiday weekend in common English. Okay? So there was an extra day off. So when Jesus was took down on preparation day, having died at the same time as the Passover lambs were slaughtered at the temple, right? he's then put into the tomb. There is at least two full days, and on the third day he rises. On the third day. Do you understand? So therefore we need to understand that Good Friday is a Catholic tradition. If anything, it should be Good Thursday. Maybe even Good Wednesday. Do you understand? So that Jesus can fulfill what he said, I'll be there for three days. Do you understand? Okay? So try and lose Good Friday from your minds if you can. All right? This is very important because so often you'll be witnessing, say, to Muslims, and they'll say, there's a contradiction in your Bible. Jesus said he'd be there for three days. If he was crucified on Friday and got up on the Saturday, on Sunday, I should say, then he was only there for one day. And they'd be right. But we don't believe in Good Friday, do we? We believe what the Bible says, not Catholic doctrines. All right? So we need to get rid of that confusion. They came and they wanted to break their legs so that they would die quickly because once their legs were broken they couldn't push themselves up so therefore the pressure would be on their rib cages they'd be hanging they wouldn't be able to clear their lungs and be dead in minutes but when they came to Jesus he was already dead but the Roman soldiers are not divvies they know about death they've been in battles they know how to kill somebody and make sure that they're dead and they know that no man can survive having his diaphragm cut the diaphragm is a big slab of muscle that goes across underneath your lungs and it helps you to breathe okay they thrust a spear into his side and they slice him open not just a little stab they'd have cut him open and it says that blood and water flowed out that means that he was definitely dead because that water can only be water that came from his lungs after he died his lungs would have started to fill up naturally okay so therefore with those fluids once they were cut into the diaphragm cut through the rib cage then water came out he was definitely dead and that's medical fact okay first and foremost i think that john is simply making a medical statement he's saying look he was definitely dead because he knew that there would always be people who would say oh he never really died he never really died and people try to say that even today but there was a witness and it's testified that this witness knows that what he's saying is true that water came out that means that everybody who understands a human body would know that he was definitely 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 dead he could not have recovered in the cool of the tomb or any some some nonsense like that all right and this is underlined but also there's a theological point because water and blood was also used in the rituals in the temple all right so therefore maybe john is also making another allusion to the temple and the ritual sacrifices of the tabernacle all right some have tried to say that it's a fulfillment of john 7 verse 38 where Jesus said rivers of water would flow from the, from the belly. Okay? And of course that literally does actually happen here at this point. But I think the fulfillment of John 7.38 is actually in chapter 20 where Jesus says receive the Holy Spirit and he breathes on them. Because in John 7.39 it states that Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit which later those would receive after he'd been glorified. You understand? And that's in John 20 verse 22. Okay. There's also a reference to blood and water in 1 John 5 and verse 6, which may also allude to the same thing about atonement. All right. In verse 36, he's got a direct quote from Psalm 34, verse 20. And again, it may also be a reference to the Passover lamb. Okay. Because it says not one of his bones will be broken. And it was laid out in Exodus 12 that the Passover lamb was not to have any bones broken. Okay? It may also be a reference to another psalm which is about the protection of the believer under God. But that seems a bit bizarre in the context of the fact that Jesus has just received an almighty beating and has been killed. You think, well, where's, where's God's protection for that? The fact of the matter is that God does protect even in those circumstances. Because if you remember the story of Job, God told Satan exactly how far he could go. He put a limit on him. He drew a line. He said, Satan, this is what you can do to Job. You can do this, this, and this, but you can't do that. God protects his believers. 
even martyrs who were killed. You remember it said in Matthew's Gospel that many of you would be delivered unto death, but yet not a hair of your head would perish. And you think, well, how can that be? If you're saying we've been delivered to death, we're going to be martyrs, and yet our hair is not going to... How can this be? The reason is because God is looking at something deeper than our, the state of our body. We're not to look at the state of Jesus' body. We're looking at where he really was. We know the future. We know about the resurrection, don't we? We know what's going to happen soon after this. We know that this is not the end. The Jews thought this is the end of him. He's finished. He's done for. But it's far from it. This is just the beginning of the story, isn't it? Because we know what happens next. There is an old Jewish tradition that if your bones were broken, you wouldn't be resurrected, but that's not in Scripture. All right? So we can forget about that one. Following that, in verse 37, there's a quote which is from Zechariah 12. And if you remember, Zechariah was also the place from which we found the quote, Here is the man. All right? And in Zechariah, which is all about the Messiah and about the second return of Jesus, most people know those passages about uh, Zechariah where his feet would land on the Mount of Olives. Do you know the one? Okay, you've all heard that one? Okay, it's all about the return of Christ. But also in the earlier part of Zechariah, there's a lot about the first coming of Jesus. It's in the first part of Zechariah that you hear about, here comes your king, gentle and riding on a donkey, bringing salvation, bringing peace. Okay? Here he quotes Zechariah 12, which is intriguing because the quote from Zechariah 12.10 is the Lord himself, Yahweh, God, speaking about himself. Speaking about himself. So if John applies this to Jesus, who is Jesus? He's God, isn't he? He's Yahweh. Jehovah, as some people say. Amazing. This quote is also, like I said, in Revelation 1 verse 7, where it says that they'll look upon the one they have pierced and they will mourn as one mourns for an only child. Jesus is, of course, the only begotten Son of God. But they will mourn not just because they crucified him. They'll mourn because they're on the wrong end of judgment. They will realize who he is. They'll see him and they will be filled with regret. And the only expression that can ever come close to how full of regret they're going to be is the kind of regret that somebody feels when their only son is killed. That unspeakable grief. I mean, it'd be one thing if, you know, I mean... It's not to lessen the grief if somebody loses a child and they've got other children, but if it was your only child and that child was killed, how would you mourn? That is the grief that these people are going to feel when they realize that they rejected Jesus as their Lord. That is the grief that they're going to feel. They'll be speechless, absolutely speechless. Finally, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, our old friend Nicodemus from chapter 3. In chapter 3, Nicodemus was searching. He was asking Jesus questions. Halfway through the Gospel, we see him standing up against the leadership concerning Jesus. But now we see him burying Jesus. He shows a lot of devotion for Jesus. He brings 75 pounds of spices. It sounds like an awful lot. I'm not sure exactly how much it is, but I get the impression that it's a, it's a sackful. It's as much as a man could carry. And expensive stuff as well. And he brings this as an act of devotion to Jesus. He gets his hands dirty. From a Jewish point of view, this would be a real act of devotion because by touching a dead body, he was then unclean and couldn't take the Passover. He was ritually unclean. So therefore, he was barred from the Jewish Passover. But the real truth is that the priests had stayed out of the Gentile fortress because they didn't want to be ritually unpure so that they could take part in the Passover. As this is going on, they're getting ready for their Passover feast. They've got their lamb roasting. They're setting out the table. They've got their families. They're ritually pure. And they're getting ready to celebrate, not only the Passover, but they've got rid of that troublemaker, Jesus. Cause to celebrate. But inside, what state were those men? They'd committed murder that day. And yet they were doing a religious act in a, as a worship to God? Yet they committed murder. But here's Joseph and Nicodemus. They're ritually impure now. They can't take part in the Jewish festival. But inwardly, they're changed people. 
Inwardly, they're believers. Inwardly, they're the only ones who are pure. Inwardly, they're the only ones who are clean. Because what is it that cleanses us? It's through faith in Jesus Christ and it's his blood. So the very blood that was on Nicodemus' hands now as he cleans the body of Christ is the blood that cleanses him. That's marvellous, isn't it? Marvellous. Fantastic. Right. What's sad, though, is that from a human point of view, Nicodemus, if he doesn't know about the resurrection that's coming, which nobody seemed to, as far as he's concerned, this is too late. Would it not have been better if he'd shown a bit of devotion to Jesus while he was alive? It's a bit late to do it when the man's dead, isn't it? It's interesting how sometimes we'll pass up relationships with people. We won't talk to people for years on end, and then when they die, they, we go to their funeral. Or we'll spend a lot of money on a, on a posh coffin. What good is that to a person? Better to go to them while they're alive. Better to go and show them some devotion while you can still appreciate it. A couple of little points before we finish. One is that they wrap Jesus in strips of linen with a separate cloth around his face. Why is that significant? Who's heard of the Shroud of Turin? Who's heard of it? Yeah? It's a big bed sheet that was wrapped around somebody who was crucified. There are a lot of similarities with the crucifixion of Jesus. He appears to have a crown of thorns. The image of the face is right there. It's very cleverly done. It's got um, pollen and things which associate it with Palestine. So it may have been made in Palestine from genuine things. It may have been from a genuine crucifixion. Maybe it was a Christian who was crucified. Because Jesus was crucified, then he was crucified. and He was a martyr. Maybe. We don't know. But one thing we do know is that it's not from Jesus. Because Jesus was wrapped in strips of linen. Amen. I saw a big debate about the Shroud of Turin. They had DNA tests. They did x-rays of it. They did scans of it. They did this, that and the other. They looked into historical records. And nobody had the common sense to go and look at an eyewitness account written by somebody who was there at the time who said he was wrapped in bandages. It's right there. So the Shroud of Turin... Interesting though it is, fascinating though it is, as archaeological evidence, it's not some holy relic with the face of Jesus on it. It's somebody else. Somebody else. Sorry to bust somebody's bubble. Well, not really. I love it. All right. What's also interesting is that Jesus is buried in accordance with Jewish burial customs. It's underlined, just as a final note, Jesus is still Jewish. Just because the Jews have rejected him doesn't mean that Jews have been rejected by Jesus. Okay? He's still embracing the fact that he's Jewish. He still is even buried as a Jew in Jewish ways, Jewish traditions, Jewish customs. And we should never forget the Jewishness of Jesus. Never forget it. He might be the saviour for the Gentiles, but at the end of the day, he is who he is. He is who he is. And we should never forget that. Hallelujah. After that, there follows three days' silence, during which we don't know what happens. We're not told. We don't know where Jesus went exactly, physically or spiritually. We don't know where the disciples went during that time, whether they were close by or whether they went back home to Galilee. We don't know. But what we do know is that there's complete silence throughout scripture about the next three days which makes them very mysterious but next week we'll pick up with what happens after them which is far more interesting let's bow our heads in prayer hallelujah Mark do you want to close in prayer Lord, that you would strengthen us, my God. And Lord, that you would give us traveling mercy.